Well, hello, folks, and welcome to the Teeter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope that you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the podcast or watching it. I'm doing a video version of these podcasts now. That's what you're seeing if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening uh, to the podcast on a traditional podcast platform, well, if you ever get tired of that or just want to stream it at the house on your stereo throughout the house speaker sound system, you can stream it on YouTube. You can probably do that on podcast too. I assume there's a way to stream a podcast through your house home entertainment system, but I haven't done that yet, so I don't know exactly how to do it. But it's a cool thing about technology. We can do a lot of stuff uh, that we couldn't do 5, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the podcasting has really changed. That's that's become a uh, that's become a very popular form of media for people to listen to and to uh, get out some more long form content. A lot of stuff I talk about uh, on my podcast is stuff that I do videos on on my YouTube channel. For any of y'all who have not seen my YouTube channel, go to DieterMillhornFishing.com and there's a link right there on my website to the YouTube channel, to the podcast, to the guide service that I do on some lakes here in the Carolinas. Uh, the fishing gear that I use, and there's also a contact uh, section there where you can send me an email uh, if you got any questions about anything. But uh, the yeah, it's 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 been an interesting interesting ride with doing the podcast and adding it. I enjoy doing them. We can give it a little more attention than we can on YouTube, and uh, you know YouTube the way it's targeted toward people uh, that are watching stuff. It's kind of quick cut, quick happening kind of stuff. Here on the podcast, uh, we can get into a little more long-form discussion and talk and rambling, if you will, uh, that you, doesn't really work in a traditional YouTube video. Now, you're asking yourself, well, why are you putting these videos up on YouTube? Well, these are not really designed to get views. They're not really designed to get a lot of people watching. Uh, so it's, it's basically for the people who are loyal followers, like this kind of content to watch. So... Uh, it's kind of the reason we're doing these. Uh, what we're going to get in today, uh, this has come up uh, again. I've talked about it before, but that's Pay Lakes. And uh, I, uh, this stuff starts to service about this time of the year. Usually in the springtime is when it starts. Uh, but I had a lot of people ask about Pay Lakes. Uh, people that are new to catfishing, new to the catfish world. Uh, and I was just going to talk about it for a few minutes and let people kind of bring them up to date on what it is, what exactly they mean, what exactly are they. Uh, because there's just a lot of mix of information out there is what it comes down to. So, uh, and just kind of, like I said, I've got some videos on this. I don't think they're as good as this podcast will be. So that's kind of why I wanted to go over this and talk about it. But you'll hear the term pay lakes. And basically what that is, is a private lake that you pay to go fish at. Uh, sometimes you pay by the day. Sometimes you pay by how many fish you catch. Sometimes you compete in tournaments there where they fish for fish, biggest fish of the day, biggest fish of the hour, smallest fish of the hour, all kinds of different stuff. Uh, these lakes, you can catch catfish, you can catch carp, you can catch trout, uh, and I'm sure there are probably other pay lakes out there to where you can pay to catch these fish. Uh, when I was growing up, we would go to one. Uh, some of you from the Charlotte area may remember Bearcat Lake over near what is now the Charlotte Douglas International Airport. Uh, I think the airport actually ended up buying the property in the store there. Uh, that was uh, a lake that they would stock with bullheads. They would buy farm-raised bullheads that were, you know, 8 to 10 inches long, maybe 12 inches at the most. And you could pay and you could catch a pile of these fish. And, uh, you know, we would go there. Uh, there were some other lakes uh, near us that were, you know, carp and catfish lakes. The big thing around here was carp lakes. And uh, basically, you know, they would have catfish in them, too. Uh, back then, it was a lot more channel catfish and stocked farm race fish because, which we'll get into here in a minute, there wasn't a place to harvest these big fish from. So the fish you buy from farm ponds, these fish farms where they raise these fish, are relatively small. Uh, just because of the business model that these places operate on, they have to grow these fish and turn these fish relatively quickly. So they can't let them sit there for 
6, 8, 10, 12 years and grow into trophy size fish. At least not yet. We'll talk about that too. Um, but these lakes were stocked with these fish. You'd get fish. The biggest thing then, as it probably is in my area right now, is carp fishing. And uh, this is basically a legalized form of gambling uh, that still circumvents the tax regulations out there because nobody pays taxes on their winnings at these places. Uh, they have a variety of, I guess you would call it, plans on these tournaments. Some of them are, big, you know, like I said, big fish of the night. They don't have a big fish of the hour. You may buy into the hourly prize. You may do a small fish. It, it, they got all kinds of different things. And there are tens of thousands of dollars exchanged at these places. Uh, we're not talking $20, $30 prize winnings. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars on a Friday or Saturday night. And uh, these people paid to catch these fish. Now, the size of the fish here, it's not so much... These people are not so much geared into catching. I mean, it's great if you catch if you got big fish in there. But the bottom line is, if there's only ten pound fish, you want to catch the ten pound fish because that's what's going to win. Uh, but they're pretty big fish in these lakes, is what it comes down to. And uh, these fish come from public waters. They are caught by fishermen that sell these carp to these lakes. So you could go out, and I know several places where these guys will set up on a lake. They will bait an area, they will put out rods, they will catch these carp, put them into a large holding tank, and then they will take these fish to these lakes and sell them to them. They pay varying prices on them. I have been offered $3 a pound for some of the trophy catfish. Uh, obviously, I haven't sold any to them, but people have seen that I catch these fish and they've offered to buy them. I don't know what they pay for carp, but I'm sure it's some similar one, two, three bucks a pound for the bigger fish. The bigger fish are the prizes that they want. They want the 30, 40, 50 pound fish in there. And people will sell these fish to these lakes. Now, that being said, that is perfectly legal where we are. There is no law being broken at all. Uh, they're not skirting the regulations. There is nothing being done to circumvent the law in doing it. This is also done with catfish. Catfish are sold to these lakes, uh, more so in other parts of the country, from what I understand, to where they have trophy catfish lakes. And there's a bigger focus on, uh, you know, fishing for trophy catfish, having these pay late catfish tournaments. It's the same process as it is for carp. Uh, you know, you pay, you do a buy-in, whatever, and you catch your fish, you take them up to the fish house and the scales, they weigh them, they put them back in the water. You don't keep these fish, actually. Uh, most of these places do not let you keep these trophy fish. These trophy fish are there to attract the fishermen to come in there and fish because everybody wants to catch a big fish. And uh, most of the time, uh, when you see a somebody who's caught a pay lake fish and the picture's up somewhere, usually they'll be kneeled behind it It'll be laying on the ground, and they'll kind of hold it up on both ends. That's kind of what they call the pay lake pose. It's kind of the way a lot of these fish are photographed when you're at these places. Uh, a little different setup than what you'll see most people fishing off the bank. Uh, you know, we have people around here that catch these fish uh, from our lakes, our waterways. They take them to these lakes. They sell them. Sometimes it's the people from the lake uh, that on the lake that is out setting baskets and trot lines and uh other things to catch these fish uh they uh, they are doing it for the most part perfectly legal in the catching of the fish and the putting them into a private lake many times their baskets and trot lines are put out illegally they are not marked they are not in areas of the water that they are supposed to be in uh they may be bigger than usual i've Snag plenty of them pulling up anchors, and uh, yeah, I've never found one that has had proper markings on it. Uh, but that's what is done with these fish. They are taken to these lakes, dumped into the lake, and they are fished for. Now, again, perfectly legal. There are no laws in our state that prohibit that from happening. There are no laws in place in our states that prohibit the transport of those fish to another state to sell them to another place. So if Virginia ran out of fish. There is nothing that prohibits somebody taking those fish there. As far as I know, North Carolina, South Carolina laws. Don't know about Virginia laws on the importation, but most states are designed that way. It's perfectly legal what you're doing. Um, 
you know, the issue is uh, what gets everybody riled up about it is, is that they are taking these fish from public water and putting them into a monetizing them, basically, and putting them into a private establishment. Um, I, as a fisherman, don't like it. OK, I mean, I, I don't like the fact that I'm into catch and release. I support that, especially on trophy fish. Uh, and now with that said, what they're doing is elite. What they're doing is perfectly legal. So it it there there's not a lot you can say except I don't like it. It would be no different than somebody catching that fish and throwing it in a cooler and killing it and eating it. It's going to end up take being taken out of the public pool. It's going to end up dying. And it's going to end up going. What happens to a lot of these fish, and I have no proof of this uh, whatsoever, but what I've heard, the common comment is that these fish die in these lakes. Um, a lot of them are poorly, if at all, oxygenated. Uh, some of them are oxygenated very well and run very well. Uh, I know of one locally, a small one that came up about 10 years ago, and it was not. It was nothing but a big hole that somebody dug out with an excavator and filled up with water and it was basically a big it was almost like a cattle pond and uh no oxygen in or anything but i have seen some of these lakes that have oxygen you know run to them and sprinkler systems and everything else but the popular consensus is that all these fish die in there eventually and that may or may not be true i do not know i cannot speak to that but uh the bottom line is is that they keep putting these fish in there every year and that's usually what gets people stirred up is you get on facebook somebody gets a video these pay lakes are big about you know showing them dumping these fish in there we're dumping in 1200 pounds 1500 pounds whatever fish and they do this typically in the springtime that's generally when this season starts cranking up um and you know you'll see it into the summertime because that's when these places are really the most busy and, uh, you know, people see it, they'll see all these big flatheads, uh, you know, they'll see some blues and they'll be dumped in there. And they seem to do this every year. Now, I don't know how often they do it. Uh, I don't know if this is like a one-time thing and it kind of just gets perpetuated into the loop of it's happening all the time. I really don't know. I don't know how many fish they put into these lakes. Uh, I don't know how many pounds they put in there. I don't know how often they do it. I'm sure it varies with the different lakes. Uh, but one thing's for sure if they are doing it over and over and over, even on a yearly basis, the fish that are in there must be dying. There must be less of them. Because if you put 100 fish into a lake and they're living, there really wouldn't be any need to put 100 more fish in there next year. Because the fish that are in there should be getting bigger if they're fed properly, which I don't know if they are or not. Uh, but they should still be there. So it... it you can understand the argument that these fish are dying, you know, not, uh, you know, people have said they sing fish on top of the water, but we all know that not all fish that die go to the top of the water. Uh, some of them, uh, that die are picked apart and opened up before they surface. So you can have a fish that dies in there. You never see it on the surface. So that's possible. Those fish could be eaten by turtles or they could be floundering around on the bottom and a turtle gets a hold of them and, once a turtle rips one open, it's not going to float anymore. So that's possible. But the bottom line is what they're doing is legal. What needs to happen if you want this changed, you don't like this, and it has a negative impact is obviously laws need to be changed. There needs to be some kind of limitation put on them. And the only way that is going to happen is if biologically you can prove that it's having a negative effect on fishery. And that's where the tough part comes in because that takes research. That takes, you know, more than just, you know, conjecture and fisherman stories and doc talk uh, to prove that it's having a negative impact because it is possible, as crazy as this sounds, that harvesting these fish, some of these fish, can be a good thing for a fisher. Depending on the fishery, the health of the fishery, how many fish are in there, how much food there is, it is possible and an argument be made that some of those fish need to be taken out because there is a finite amount of food. That means a limited amount of food in any lake, any fishery. It is like, and I've said this before, it's like sitting down at the table with a pizza and it's cut up into a whole bunch of slices. Okay. You can cut that pizza into four slices. You can cut it into 20 slices, but the bottom line is you got one pizza. If it's just me eating it, Okay, I'm going to get fatter than I already am because all of that pizza is mine. 
But if I got 20 people around here, guess what? My fat butt's going to lose some weight because I'm not going to get to eat as much. Okay, that food's getting divided out. So you could make an argument that some of these lakes, you know, maybe too many of these fish, you know. Catch and release has gotten more and more popular. It's what I do. It's what I promote. It's what I support. Uh, it's becoming more and more popular with trophy fishermen, tournament fishermen, et cetera. Uh, so it could be that maybe some of these fish need to be taken out. There needs to be a balance. The bottom line is we don't know. Uh, the bottom line is we ain't got no research to really figure that out or support any of that. Most of the regulations that get put in place are by angler demand versus biological reasoning. Okay, and, and a lot of what I'm getting at is with largemouth bass regulation, largemouth bass get a lot of research done on them. There's a lot of studies done on them because they're very popular. A lot of people fish for them. But a lot of those regulations are put in place because of anglers' demands. You know, they, they demand that they want this done, and, and, and we want the protection and all that. Okay, anglers demand it. When you can get a little bit of science and a lot of angler demand, you can get a law changed. And uh, that that's kind of what we're going to have to be looking at because if we want this stuff changed like i do uh there's going to have to be some research put into it and that's the tough part there's going to have to be some biological reasoning behind it uh what's tough is when you go to a lake and you look at tournament results over a course of 10 years and the average catch of those fish the average winning weights the average top 10 the average weight of all the fish does nothing but increase during that time, ten year period. It's hard to say there's anything wrong with that fishery except that your fish are getting bigger. Now you can go to another lake and look at those average or a river system, uh, maybe even an individual pool in that river system, and you look at the weigh-ins over the past 10, 20 years. All things being equal, those numbers start going down. That may be a clue that. Some of those bigger fish are being taken out. They're being over-harvested. Could be that. Could be water quality. It's hard to say, but it takes some research and some scientific data to do that. And that's the thing that we kind of we kind of we kind of lack in, in all of this. And my hope is that we get some of it. My hope is is that the ACA, the American Catfishing Association, will step up and be a leader in that direction because if they have the collective power of anglers in this country. They should use that as a lobbying force to get some stuff changed. And that is my hope that the ACA will do that. Uh, I hope that they put more effort into that than they do into the tournament world. I know the tournament thing is their big thing now. That's all we really hear out of them. Uh, there's a few emails sent around about some regulation change here and there. But the focus so far has been, as we thought it would be, has been on the tournament world. And that's what they're geared toward. That's where... Basically, the low-hanging fruit is, uh, and that's where the low-hanging fruit was in getting this organization started. I'm all for this organization. I want it to work out. I want it to be that legislative power, uh, but they're going to have to start swinging the bat up a little bit if they're going to make some home runs, and they're going to have to start getting some stuff in place uh, because I think, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, I think more people are interested in that than they are seeing a boat given away at a catfish tournament or for being a part of this organization. I think people are more willing to jump on board for protecting the resource than for winning a points race through the ACA. So uh, I, I'm hoping that they will be our, our, our arm, our, 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 our leader in battle. Now, with that said, we don't need the ACA to do this. Okay. Bottom line is we've done it in North Carolina. Uh, small group, small force, local. We were able to do it in North Carolina. It just got done in South Carolina. ACA didn't have anything to do with any of that. So it can be, get done. Uh, you don't have to have a big organization. You just have to have some dedicated folks in an area that are willing to step up and put in the time to do it. It does take time. It takes work. You got to get out there and do some digging. Uh, you got to make friends with some people, some people that can help you do this. Uh, the biologists, the regulators, the whining, complaining, and moaning about everything they do is not going to get you anywhere. You got to have people that can communicate, can talk to these people, figure out what it takes to make the change. They did it in South Carolina. And listen, I didn't think that was going to happen. If you hadn't heard what happened, uh, they were uh, South Carolina got some regulations a few years ago on Santee Cooper. It was a, one fish over 36 inches. 
They came back this past year, changed that to two fish over 32 inches and a 25 fish limit. So, and this was on Santee and the rivers that feed it. So, we're like, hey, that's a start. You know, that's a that's 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 a good start. That's on Santee Cooper. Two fish over 32. We've reduced the size, uh, but you give them two fish. There's a, actually a blue catfish limit for the first time ever in the state. 25 fish, which is a lot. It should be per boat instead of per person. But the fact is, it's something. And then something miraculous happened. This thing went through the legislative process. As written, it got passed, signed off on. And somewhere, it was going, and we're like, hey, this is going to pass. This is awesome. Somewhere right before it got passed, right before the governor signed it, somebody added, I think, four words where it said, blah, 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 all, you know, Santee Cooper Lakes and the rivers that feed them. And they added, comma, and all state waters. They really did that. They added those four words and nobody paid any attention to it. And it got passed. So now South Carolina has these regulations apply to the entire state. Now, never thought that would have happened in South Carolina. Again, we'd love to have it 25 fish per boat instead of per person, but it's better than nothing. So my point is this stuff can get done without an ACA type organization, without a national organization. A national organization helps. It helps on a bigger level would be a bigger level of being a focal point for people to go to. Say you've got a research student that is trying to do research on catfish and they want to do a tagging program and they need money funding for the tags. They could go to the ACA and say, hey, can we get some of your grant money, your research money, your, you know, resource protection money? They could get twenty five, thirty thousand dollars dollars uh, you know, for something like that. That's where a big national organization with the collective power of people around the country comes into play. Uh, you know, they have some power when it comes to maybe dealing with federal regulations on some of these fish. But again, you don't ha you don't have to have that to do it. So we're hoping the ACA steps up and gets to the ball rolling on some things and starts swinging the bat and hitting some home runs. Uh, but don't feel like you have to have them to do it. If you've got something you want to do in your area, Get some people together, form a group, get a few good people that can communicate and figure out what it takes to make the change and make the effort in your area. It, it can be done. It takes effort. That's the hardest part. Uh, you know, the I get frustrated when I see these posts and go, somebody needs to do something. Somebody. How many times do you see that? This needs to change. Boom, they're off to the next day. You know, that's somebody's you. You know, that's somebody's me. Uh, that that somebody is is nobody special. It's nobody with some super duper power out there. It's just a regular person that gets this ball rolling. That's usually what happens with a lot of these regulations. You get a small group of people. There may be some people from a fishing tournament, a fishing group, a fishing club. That's why it gets regulations changed with trout, bass, you know, musky, walleye, whatever. It's a small group of people that usually gets it started. So that change can come from you. So uh, if you're listening, get that group of people together. Uh, if, if you're looking at changes, you're hey, listen, this doesn't happen. I have to happen everywhere. There's some places that got their crap together. Things are going just fine, and you might not need to change. But some places they do. The other thing is be open-minded to what the biologists tell you. Uh, they're not out to get you. They're not out to screw you over. Uh, listen to what they say. Their stuff's based in science. Their stuff's based in what they can prove, document, see, instead of what they hear. And uh, so keep an open mind to what they're telling you, what they're saying, because a lot of times the relationship we've had with the folks here in the Carolinas, they've been very helpful and pointing us in the right direction on what needed to be done and what would work and what won't work. So, uh, so anyway, that's my take on pay lakes. Uh, just uh, conservation, conservation efforts, what you can do with catfish, catfish regulation, all that kind of stuff. So hopefully it gives you something to think about. And uh, we'll just have to uh, let that one go for now. A lot to revisit, a lot to come back to and talk about. So until then, we'll just catch you out on the water. Well, folks, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Here are a couple more videos that I think you're going to like. I'd watch that one and then that one. No... No, do, do that one first and then that one. I, I don't know. Just watch them both. They're both good.